Uh, he will talk about type D quiver representation varieties, double Cosmanians, and symmetric varieties. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much for uh, um, the invitation to speak and for organizing this conference. Um, so I, I want to talk to you today um, about uh, some recent work um, from about a year ago, um, as well as some work in progress um, on type D quiver representation varieties. Um, and so my plan for, for the talk um, really is to sort of divide it into sort of two halves because we'll have a break in the middle. Uh, the first sort of just over a half will be mostly background. And then the recent work on type D will come after the break. So I apologize for, for people who, uh, you know, completely know the background and uh, this is review. Oops, let's see, there we go, okay. So part one is background and motivation. Um, and I want to just start off with something that uh, probably everybody is familiar with, um, which are classical determinantal varieties. Um, and so uh, we can consider the affine space of, of matrices, just D naught by D1 matrices, and we can interpret this as um, just linear maps between base vector spaces, C to the D naught uh, to C to the D1. I'll use row vector spaces, so that's why I have D naught by D1 matrices. Um, I'll let X be a generic matrix of variables of the same size. Um, and then we have a natural right action of the product for general linear groups on this matrix space given by conjugation. So uh, on one hand, we're doing arbitrary row operations on one side and arbitrary column operations on the other side. Um, and what are the orbits then? Well, because I can do arbitrary row operations on one side and arbitrary column operations on the other side, I can turn any matrix into a matrix with ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So orbits are determined by matrix rank. Okay, and so this is familiar maybe from your linear algebra class. Um, and, and so of course then orbit closures um, are determinantal varieties, the classical determinantal varieties that are defined by uh, prime ideals, uh, namely take one size larger minors um, of this generic matrix X. And we know lots and lots about determinantal varieties, right? Uh, they're, they're normal in cohen macaulay with rational singularities. Um, they have nice Grobner bases. Um, uh, orbit closure containment, if we're thinking about the com complete collection of determinantal varieties, is easily understood, right? It's just the stratification by rank. Um, their uh, their multi-graded Hilbert series are understood. Uh, if we worked in positive characteristic instead, they're all uh, Frobenius split, um, et cetera, okay? So we know lots about determinantal varieties. And so I'm using this as my starting point, um, and we are gonna generalize that by working with orbit closures of quiver representations, okay? So even though I'm sure that everybody is uh, familiar with these definitions, just in case, uh, maybe let me review them. Um, so a quiver is a finite directed graph. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be mostly interested in quivers that are of Dinkin type. Um, so here I have an A2, A3, and D4 quiver um, at the top of the screen. Uh, a representation of Q is an assignment of a vector space to each vertex and a linear map to each arrow. Um, so here are three representations of the three quivers that I have above. Um, and I'm interested in this talk of, with particular spaces of representations of a given quiver. And those spaces of representations um, are, are, are collections of matrices that occur once I fix a based vector space at each vertex. So a dimension vector, this D, D naught through Dn for the quiver Q, assigns this based vector space, C to the Di, to the vertex Q. Okay, so di determines the dimension at each vertex. Um, and so, for example, uh, above, uh, in the A2 quiver, my dimension vector would be 2, 3, uh, then 1, 2, 3, or sorry, 1, 2, 1, um, and so on. Okay. Um, a representation space, uh, rep QD, is going to be the space of all representations of Q with a fixed dimension vector. So this is, you know, this boring affine space. It's just collections of matrices, right? One matrix for each arrow, um, and I allow my matrices to vary, but I have to fix the size of the matrix. So I'm not considering all possible representations for my quiver, just the ones with a fixed dimension vector, okay? Um, and then once I fix this dimension vector, um, I have an action by a product of general linear groups, just like I did in the case on the very first slide uh, for 
um, determinantal varieties. There I had this A2 quiver, right? And I had general linear group acting on each side. Now I have uh, a larger quiver and I have a, 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 this base change group that acts by change of basis or conjugation um, on my representation space. And, and I'll call a quiver locus one of an orbit closure for this action, okay? So here's my, my baby example, uh, linking back to the first slide. Uh, here's a little A2 quiver. I'll consider the dimension vector two, three. So I have C squared, say at the first vertex and C cubed at the second vertex. Then the representation space, well, that's just the collection of all two by three matrices because they determine the linear maps from C2 to C3. Uh, orbits we know are parameterized by rank, right? I can act, I'm acting on one side by GL2, the other side by GL3. So I can do arbitrary row and column operations, and I, I have three orbits here, okay? Uh, and the quiver loci are the determinantal variety. So this is really familiar, uh, probably, but I'm just changing the, the language that I'm using now. Um, instead of thinking determinantal varieties, I'm going to call them quiver loci. All right. So I'm primarily in this talk interested in the Dinkin case. Um, and so for Q-connected, um, Gabrielle's theorem tells us that uh, rep QD has finitely many orbits for all D if and only if Q is of Dinkin type A, D, or E, okay? Um, so if we're in the finite orbit case, we're in the Dinkin case. Um, and in this case, um, a theorem of Bongart says that, um, set theoretically at least, orbit closures are determined by minors of some somewhat complicated block form matrices, okay? So they're determined by minors of matrices. So again, they're generalizations of the very first slide, the determinantal case. Um, so here's maybe a first generalization of the first slide, which would be equi-oriented type A4. Um, and here orbits are known uh, to be determined by the ranks of these matrices. So certainly the ranks of each of the individual matrices are invariant under the action of the base change group by this conjugation action, right? doing row and column operations isn't going to change the ranks. Similarly for the compositions of any matrices that I can take compositions of. Okay, and remember I'm using row vector spaces, so that's why my compositions appear um, in that order. Okay, um, and then it's not that hard to check that, that this is the complete list of, of ranks that characterize the orbits. Okay, um, here's a non-Dinkin example. Here's the Jordan quiver. Um, here, of course, uh, we have infinitely many orbits. Um, it, the orbits are characterized by the Jordan canonical forms, okay? So we're, we're not in this, in this setting in this talk. Okay, okay so um, that's sort of some very basic uh, background definition. So, so why might you want to look at these objects? Um, so my, my motivation comes from sort of commutative algebra and algebraic geometry. Um, certainly, there are many other reasons to look at this, but from a commutative algebraic perspective, um, we've sort of already seen a reason why you might want to look at Dinkin quiver loci, um, and that's because up to radical, at least, uh, Dinkin quiver loci are generalized determinantal varieties, right? They're, they're determined by rank conditions on collections of block matrices, um, um, and, and they include examples of many classically studied varieties, uh, for example, the, the determinantal varieties, uh, the buchsbaum eisenbud varieties of complexes are a special case of the equi-oriented uh, type A quiver loci. Um, but, and so understanding just commutative algebraic properties of these objects are quite natural. Um, a second motivation, which is really the primary motivation in some sense for this talk, um, and for the work that, that is done in the second half of this talk, um, is in the study of degeneracy loci of vector bundles. Um, and I'll say more about that on the next slide. Um, but that's really um, the, the direction that I'm coming at this at. Um, there are, of course, other uh, motivations for studying uh, representations of, of quivers or from this geometric perspective, these quiver loci. Uh, for example, um, there's well well known connection to representation theory of algebras uh, that won't appear in this talk, but maybe uh, let me just briefly say that uh, the category of representations of quivers uh, is equivalent to the category of uh, modules over the path algebra of the quiver, and there are connections between the geometry of quiver loci uh, to the representation theory of the quiver. So, for example, degeneration order, which is one thing that will show up in this talk, um, is is orbit closure containment order. So. Uh, on the first slide, when we were working with that A2 quiver, the degeneration or order was just the order, the order that was obtained by rank 
um, of the matrices, right? The orbit closures were, were stratified by rank. Um, more generally, it gets more complicated, uh, but Bongartz tells us that, that this can be computed in terms of dimensions of Hahn spaces, um, of representations of the quiver. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so this is, this is one, one characterization of that. Um, but yeah, so there are lots of motivations for studying these. Um, these are just uh, two of them. Uh, so what about that, that motivation that I was, I'm particularly interested, um, which is degeneracy loci and quiver polynomials? Um, well, okay, so what is a degeneracy locus? Uh, so let's let Y be uh, some smooth algebraic variety. And I'm going to consider vector bundles um, of ranks M and N over my algebraic variety and a morphism of bundles, okay? Um, and I'll let R be less, a number less than or equal to the min of, of M and N. A degeneracy locus uh, are, is the, the locus where the rank of this map is less than or equal to R. So YR is the set of Y in my variety Y, such the rank of phi Y is less than R. Um, and locally, uh, this is defined by the, the vanishing of, of minors of a matrix. So it's locally determinantal. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a classical result that if, if phi is general enough, if it's a general enough map, um, then the, the cohomology class of this degeneracy locus is expressible uh, by the giambelli tom Corteus formula, okay? So in terms of a, a symmetric function, a sure function. Um, and, and in the early, I guess, late 90s or early 2000s, Buch and Fulton initiated a program that sort of generalized this. Um, they found a, an analogous formula when we're considering um, sequences of vector bundle maps. Okay, so not just a single map of bundles, right, which locally looks determinantal. Uh, instead, now we're looking at this sort of vector bundles that fit into this equi-oriented AN quiver sitting over an algebraic variety. Um, and then a few years later, Knudsen, Miller, and Shimizono uh, produced more formulas in this uh, Buch-Fulton setting by computing um, algebraic um, uh, multi-degrees, or in other language, equivariant cohomology classes, of equi-oriented type A quivers, okay? And these are called quiver polynomials, okay? Um, and in fact, there are other interpretations of quiver polynomials uh, that might be of interest to representation theorists as well. Um, and if you read uh, some surveys on these objects, um, you'll, you'll see um, other connections as well beyond this degeneracy locus um, uh, motivation. Okay, um, and so after, after um, this occurred, more formulas were subsequently produced in both cohomology and K-theory uh, in this setting and related settings, um, and I listed a, some people that have worked on this uh, below. Okay, all right, so before I get to the, the main part of the talk, so that was background and motivation, before I get to the main part of the talk, which is the recent work on type D, I wanna outline a little bit about the type A story um, and what goes on there. Uh, just for some context, um, and so um, remember the primary goal, uh, or at least my primary goal here in this talk is to, um, is coming from this commutative algebraic or algebra geometric perspective, um, and I'm interested in singularities and uh, uh, commutative algebraic properties like Grobner bases, things like that, and these formulas for quiver polynomials, um, and so it's very helpful um, to understand the relationship for, between these type A quivers and um, other classes of well-known varieties. And in this case, uh, it turns out that there's a very close connection between uh, type A quivers and Schubert varieties. Um, and this sort of was uncovered since, I guess, at least the 1980s. Um, so just so that we all, um, again, probably review for many people, uh, but so that we're on the same page, what is a Schubert variety? Well, I'm just gonna work with type A here, type A Schubert varieties. Uh, so G will be a general linear group. Uh, B is going to be a Borel subgroup of upper triangular matrices, B minus lower triangular matrices. Uh, we'll work in the flag variety, G backslash B minus. Okay, so this is just, I'm setting these conventions, maybe um, they're not the ones you prefer, but I'm setting them just because they make the, the relationships uh, work out as they're written on the slides, okay? Um, a Schubert cell then is a, is a B plus orbit in G mod B minus and a Schubert variety is going to be one of the closures uh, and they're indexed by permutations, okay? Um, and then uh, 
the particular varieties inside of the flag variety that I'm going to be working with um, uh, are not actually Schubert varieties on the nose. They're very, very closely related varieties. Uh, they're up to some affine space factor, going to be isomorphic to open subvarieties of Schubert varieties. Um, and um, in particular, they're going to be these Kajda and Lustig varieties that were, uh, have been studied by Alex Wu and Alex Yang. Um, and they allow us to study local properties of Schubert varieties, like singularities and neighborhoods of torus fixed points, uh, local cohomology classes, things like this, uh, uh, via, via um, uh, computational algebra, basically. So, so what are these? Um, the definition is not super important. I just want to give you a flavor of uh, what they're about so that we can understand the connection to the quiver side. Okay, so a kajdan lustig variety is a generalized determinantal variety. It's associated to two permutations in the Symmetra group. Uh, the first one determines uh, essentially an opposite Schubert cell, um, really a matrix representative, re uh, matrix, matrix form of an opposite Schubert cell. So it determines a matrix of zeros, ones, and variables. Um, and W determines the Schubert variety that we're going to be working with. Uh, so it, it'll determine a collection of minors of the matrix associated to V. Um, and then each kajdan lustig variety, um, appropriately defined, is essentially an open patch of a Schubert variety. Okay. So again, this is sort of a computational uh, algebraic way of studying local properties of, of Schubert varieties. So, um, uh, so for example, here's, here's V is 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, and I, I fill in a matrix of zeros, ones, and variables. The, the ones, the four, three, two, one can be seen uh, from the locations of the ones, right? The, if you were to just make a permutation matrix associated to four, three, two, ones, you'd get a matrix of zeros and where the ones are, and the variables appear um, essentially uh, northwest of that so that this is isomorphic. Uh, if, uh, if I let the variables take on arbitrary values in C, I'd get something isomorphic to uh, the opposite Schubert cell associated to four, three, two, one. Okay, so my permutation here is in one line notation. Uh, W1423 is uh, another permutation. It's going to determine sort of northwest rank conditions that I take on the matrix associated to V. Um, and uh, I, maybe I don't need to explain uh, exactly how that works, but uh, maybe I'll just briefly say that, uh, so let's see, can I? Well, I don't see how to do that. Okay, sorry, I was going to annotate the slide, but uh, maybe I'll just briefly say that uh, the the numbers correspond to the northwest ranks of submatrices of W. So because the northwest one by one submatrix of W, that is the the matrix that contains row one, column one, has rank one, I put a one in spot one one of the rank matrix of W, uh, because the uh, the submatrix of W consisting of just row one, row two, column one, column two. So that little northwest two by two has rank one. I put a one in the northwest matrix, uh, rank matrix of W in spot two, two, um, and so on. And then I just take corresponding minors of this matrix from V. So this is just a generalized determinantal ideal. The key idea here is not the definition or any of these details. The key idea is that uh, if I'm interested in relating uh, uh, um, th these constant lucid varieties are, are determined by sort of taking northwest justified minors of certain matrices with ones, zeros, and variables. Okay. All right. So, so what is the connection to Schubert? Uh, sorry, to quiver to quiver uh, loci here, which is really what I'm interested in. Um, well, let's just do it in this example. Um, Here's this equi-oriented type A quiver. Um, orbits are determined by, as we saw before, or as I stated before, orbits are determined by ranks of certain matrices. So V1, V2, V3, V1, V2, V2, V3, and V1, V2, V3. Um, and then Zelovinsky tells us that there's a map that allows us to go from representations in my representation space to well, essentially, these kajdan lustig varieties in in a um, in a in a flag variety. Okay, so um, here um, the map is given uh, as a, as is written um, in the middle of the slide. 
And what you can sort of see is that um, the rank of V1 is, is the same as the rank of the northwest submatrix of the image consisting of uh, sort of block row one and block columns one, two, and three. Uh, the rank of V2 can also be seen as a northwest rank in the image, the rank of V3 as a northwest rank in the image. Uh, the rank of V1 times V2 is not the same, but knowing that rank is equivalent to knowing the rank of the northwest justified block submatrix consisting of uh, the top two block rows and the left three block columns. Okay, so the, the matrix that have, that where the first row is 0, 0, V1, 0, V2 identity, okay? Uh, and you just do some row and column operations and you see that it's equivalent. Um, so basically, um, what, what this allows us to say is that equi-oriented type A quiver loci are isomorphic um, to uh, open subvarieties of Schubert varieties in, um, in a G mod P or, or isomorphic up to uh, some smooth factor to an open subvariety of a Schubert variety in G mod B. Um, and, and this is, um, as I said, this, this map is due to, to Zelobinsky on varieties of complexes. It was done also by, uh, this, this result is known from Musalisha Shadri. Um, and Laxmi by and Magyar uh, more recently in, I think, 98, um, showed that this was really a scheme theoretic um, identification, not just a set theoretic identification. So you really have this isomorphism between type A quiver, equi-oriented type A quiver loci and these kajstan lustig varieties um, in type A flag varieties. Um, and so consequences is that sort of immediately you get things like prime defining ideals, you get singularity results because we know them on Schubert varieties, we get Frobenius splitting results in characteristic P, uh, we get that orbit closure containment or degeneration order um, uh, uh, for type A, equi oriented type A quivers is completely determined by Bruja order on the, uh, on the um, symmetric group, okay? Um, and so you get quite a lot via this connection to, to Schubert varieties. Um, and in general, it turns out that um, combinatorial and algebra geometric aspects of arbitrary type A uh, quiver loci are governed by corresponding um, aspects of Schubert varieties in type A flag varieties, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe that's what I'll say about that. But um, as I said uh, earlier, a primary motivation here is not just uh, sort of understanding singularities and defining ideals and these sorts of things, which we do get from the connection to Schubert varieties. It's getting these degeneracy locus formulas, right? It's, it's getting formulas for these classes um, of, of, uh, in cohomology of, de of degeneracy loci of sequences of vector bundles, say. Um, and the connection with Schubert varieties allows us to use Schubert calculus and all the combinatorics that comes from that to obtain these formulas. Okay, so that's sort of the key idea here. Okay, so maybe um, it's 1226. Maybe let me take, if it's okay, five more minutes before taking a break and then I'll be at a natural stopping point or it's okay? Okay. All right, so. Oh, yes. um, oh sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. All right, so um, maybe just before I stop, let me tell you a little bit about these formulas that I'm mentioning um, from a sort of a computational commutative algebraic perspective. Um, so I'm gonna start off with uh, S is a, a positively graded Z to the D graded polynomial ring over say C. Uh, M will be a finitely generated Z to the D graded module uh, over my polynomial ring. Um, and then a multigraded Hilbert series is, as, as probably you all know, is, is, is recording the dimensions of the module and I get this formal, formal series, okay? Um, and I can express this series um, in this positively Z to the D graded case um, as a, a fraction where I have sort of this boring denominator that is always the same and the Hilbert series is completely determined by the numerator. And the numerator is called the K polynomial, uh, K for K theory, because uh, of the connection to equivariant K classes. Um, and the multi-degree uh, is the sum of the lowest degree terms of this K polynomial when I substitute one minus T for every appearance of T. 
Um, and this is connected to, uh, and maybe more geometric language, the equivariant cohomology class. Okay. Um, and so computing these, uh, what Knutson, Miller, and Shimazono do um, in their paper is they compute these objects, these, these k polynomials in multi degrees um, of quiver loci, of equi-oriented type A quiver loci to get. Uh, and these can be interpreted as degeneracy locus formulas for vector bundles. Okay. All right, so let's just think about this in the determinantal variety case, that very first example, that A2 quiver. Um, so uh, how does this work here? Um, well, we have a uh, space of matrices, M by N matrices. Um, we have the action of the general linear group. So I look at the maximal torus in each of the general linear groups, C cross to the M cross C cross to the N. I act by conjugation. This is the induced action coming from the action by the product of general linear groups. Um, I have this torus action now, so it induces a grading on the coordinate ring, on, which is just a polynomial ring in this case. Um, and if I'm interested in the K polynomial or multi-degree of the determinantal variety, um, it is given by, the k-polynomial is given by a double Grotendieck polynomial, um, and the multi-degree is given by a double Schubert polynomial, okay? So these are the objects from Schubert calculus that I said are, are showing up. Um, and this, indeed, these, this is generalized um, and has been generalized in many ways, um, or multiple ways, to general uh, type A quivers. Um, so, for example, one that we'll see uh, in the, the at the very end of this talk, or related to something at the very end of this talk, uh, is the K polynomial of a type A quiver locus is, uh, can be expressed as a ratio of specialized double Grotendieck polynomials. Um, and this is a result in equi-oriented type A of Knutson, Miller, Shimazono, and in arbitrary type A to Ryan Kinzer, Alan Knutson, and myself. Uh, but I won't say anything more about that. Um, and there are other formulas, but maybe I'll skip this. Uh, the one thing I want to point out um, on this slide is that uh, just that there are multiple formulas in terms of these objects that are representing cohomology and K-theory of, of Schubert varieties. Um, and, and one formula is in the middle of the slide, you can express the K polynomial of a arbitrary type A quiver locus as an alternating sum of double Grotendieck polynomials. Um, and, uh, and, and a key idea here is um, to reduce to the bipartite or source sync orientation. That's sort of the orientation that's governing all the others, okay? So why don't I, st I stop there for the break um, because it's, and, and then I'll, I'll pick up in five minutes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I guess the slide has been up for a few minutes, but, um, as I said, uh, just maybe just brief recap before we continue. Uh, we're interested in, in quiver loci of Dinkin quivers. Uh, in particular, I've talked a little bit about type A um, with the view towards, with a view towards these quiver polynomials. Um, and, and when we do study type A, it is helpful, or one perspective that you could take is that it's very helpful to connect uh, to Schubert varieties because these two objects are extremely closely related to one another. There are explicit maps and bundles and things that, that connect the two uh, geometrically. Okay, um, so I'd like to discuss now some, some recent uh, joint work with Ryan Kinzer um, on connecting uh, type D quiver representation varieties to two other families of varieties that are going to play the role of the Schubert varieties. So for type D quivers, uh, the double Grassmannian, uh, uh, orbit closures, certain orbit closures in double Grassmannians and certain orbit closures in certain symmetric varieties play the role of Schubert varieties. And it, it turns out they're sort of all, it's sort of equivalent to work with any one of, any one of these families. So maybe let me just start with the theorem um, and what it says. Um, so I'm going to be working with G, a general linear group um, of, of, a plus B by A plus B invertible matrices, and K is going to be um, the subgroup GLA cross GLB embedded as two blocks along the diagonal of G. Um, and then G mod K is a, an instance of a symmetric variety. It has finitely many orbits. Um, and we can embed G mod K um, inside of a double Grassmannian the Grassmannian of A planes in A plus B space cross Grassmannians of B planes in A plus B space. So N is A plus B here, okay? 
Uh, and the reason why there's this natural embedding of G mod K into uh, GRAN cross GRBN is that I can just think of G as you know, have this space of, of invertible matrices, and then I draw a line across my invertible matrices after A rows, so that I divide my matrix into A rows and then B rows. And when I mod out by K, I've modded out by doing arbitrary row operations in the top bunch of rows and arbitrary row operations in the bottom B rows. So I have Grassmannian over Grassmannian. Okay, so, so that's the embedding of, of, of G, mod, G mod K into, into this double Grassmannian. And so, so what Ryan and I um, show is that there's this sort of explicit series of links that uh, takes you from B orbit closures in G mod K for B a Borel um, inside G mod K to B into B orbit closures of uh, double Grassmannians, uh, which sort of relate link to B orbit, uh, GLD orbit closures in representation uh, varieties for, for type D quiver representations. Um, and then they sort of circle back. There's sort of this circle of links, circle back to B orbit closures in G mod K again, but different B, different G, different K, just different sizes. Um, and, and the point here is it's not that there's explicit embeddings, which maybe these arrows uh, um, indicate, um, it, but there are sort of explicit embeddings in bundles that allow for the connections between these varieties, which allow for the transfer of algebra geometric and combinatorial properties at the target to the source. So you have this circle where you can transfer properties from target to source. So there are a lot of properties uh, that you can show very explicit uh, from using explicit sort of uh, geometric arguments uh, that um, connect these orbit closures on these three families. Um, so you get results on singularities. Uh, this recovers work of Wabinski and Zvara. Um, you get that type D uh, degeneration order um, is, can be completely combinatorially described um, in terms of uh, what's called the clans post set. So in type A, it was the Bruja post set in the symmetric group. Now it's this what's called clans post set, um, which are um, uh, strings of, and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit, but they're, they're, they're strings of, of numbers, uh, pairs, um, and pluses and minuses. They're called uh, charged involutions, and they index the um, the, the common, they give a combinatorial indexing of the the orbits in G mod K, uh, and there's a, the Bruja order there, that is the orbit closure containment order has been completely described by Ben Weiser. Um, there's a weak order there as well, in analogy with the weak order on the symmetric group that's also been described. Um, but maybe what I'll say is what don't you get from this sequence of series of links? Well, because the uh, com sort of the commutative algebraic side of the story is not as, um, uh, I guess, well studied perhaps here, uh, when we're thinking about uh, double Grassmannians or G mod K, um, unlike in type A, we don't get prime defining ideals. So we, we don't really have the same kind of computational commutative algebraic tools that we had in type A. Um, nevertheless, we do have the geometry there. Um, and so let me, let me tell you a little bit how this works. Um, the first two links that are in black here are fairly um, straightforward or, or come from things that are in the literature uh, essentially. Uh, certainly the first link is very straightforward, right? We just embed G mod K into this double Grassmannian. It's really this last link that I have in red that's the content of this theorem. So let me just talk about this last link in red. Okay. So the main idea uh, of this proof um, is a sequence of steps. Um, and so let's just say we want to start off by understanding uh, geometry and combinatorics of quiver loci or orbit closures in this quiver Q that I have at the top. And I'll, I'll put a dimension vector on it, but I, I, it has fixed dimension vector D, but I'm labeling the nodes by, by numbers, okay? That doesn't mean that's their dimension, that's just the name of the nodes. Um, and if I'm interested in this quiver, I don't wanna have to, I don't wanna have to think about every single orientation of a type D quiver independently. So I go back to the sort of one key idea that was in type A, which is relate to the bipartite setting. And if we can do that, this governs geometry in all orientations. And so we do the same thing here. We say, okay, uh, we're gonna associate an almost type D quiver to an arbitrary quiver. And it's, an, it's almost type D in that it has, you know, one extra 
one extra node at the end, right? Um, and then I'm so so it would be type D if I deleted beta naught and and x naught. Um, and that, that quiver is going to be bipartite of this orientation. So sort of up to taking opposite quivers and working with opposite uh, representations um, and, and, um, and inserting some arrows, I can always get from an arbitrary type D quiver to this almost type D quiver. Um, and I can associate it, there's an associated dimension vector that I can associate to my almost type D quiver coming from my original quiver. Um, and the, so just to indicate what the notation here means, uh, the blue um, nodes um, appear, they're the names of the original quivers, and I'm renaming the nodes of my new quiver, Q star, in terms with X's and Y's, but I'm telling you what node in the original quiver it corresponds to using a superscript in blue, okay? So you can sort of see that if I collapse all the, uh, the, say, the red arrows, alpha 1 and beta 1, and the nodes labeled 3 to one single node, I've sort of I collapsed that part of Q star to get the trivalent part of Q. And if I collapse the nodes x2 and y2, which are both labeled with the superscripts 4, to a single node, that now corresponds or looks like vertex 4. Okay, so I can do this sort of collapsing operation to and the idea here is that I'm interested in this in the in geometric questions, um, and uh, it turns out that uh, when I do this collapsing operation, uh, I can relate. I get a bundle, um, a homogeneous fiber bundle um, of essentially orbit closures upstairs in this quiver Q star to the original ones that I started with, over the original ones that I started with inside of Rep Q. Okay, so that's the idea. So so I define this open sub variety X Q in Rep Q star D star where the red arrows are invertible, and then I can realize, this is what I just said, realize each quiver locus in rep Q sort of up to a smooth factor um, as an orbit closure up to a product of general linear groups, basically one per red arrow, um, as an orbit closure in XQ. So I've now reduced studying all uh, any orientation to this particular quiver here, which is not type D, okay? Um, and then I do something that's, uh, we do something that's sort of analogous to what Zelovinsky did um, in that map that I had a number of slides back, which is embed a representation into um, what will be the analog of our opposite Schubert cell here. The analog of our opposite Schubert cell here is what I'll call a slice. Um, and this slice is sort of nice in the sense of the way the opposite Schubert cell is nice because um, if I intersect it with a B orbit closure inside of G mod K, it is isomorphic again. We we prove a sort of a kajdan lustig style lemma. It's isomorphic up to a smooth factor to an open subvariety of our orbit closure. Okay, um, and so this is my map. The second, this the sort of the slice is is this space of matrices that appears uh, at the top, and, and the map, the analog of Zelovinsky's map, um, uh, appears uh, right below it. Okay, so we send, we send a representation to this collection of matrices. Um, and the key idea is we can identify each orbit closure inside of my um, space XQ, right? XQ was this, you know, sub open sub variety of the representation space of the funny Q star quiver um, with an open sub variety of an uh, P orbit closure intersect the slice. Um, and then we show that the latter is isomorphic up to a smooth factor to an open sub variety of O bar. So basically, it's just a series of maps and bundles. Um, and so we start off with our original quiver and the orbit closure we're interested in. We look above it to this quiver Q star. We embed representations of the quiver Q star into this slice. We show that sort of rank conditions that determine the orbits in the quiver uh, Q star um, are in bijection with rank conditions that determine orbits inside of this slice in G mod K. And then we prove a kajdan lustig style lemma that allows us to finally relate this to open subvariety of orbit closure in G mod K. So we get this sort of string of connections that allows us to translate singularity property because everything is you know, nice and embeddings are smooth and things like this. Uh, it, it respects orbit closure containment. Um, so we're, al we're allowing, we get, um, uh, degeneration order in terms of this clans post set, um, uh, though we haven't actually worked out all the details there. I mean, 
it's it's true, but we don't. I, I can't tell you yet uh, exactly what how how to define a clan from a. Um, I have a recipe, but not a anyway. Um, and and we also can you know pull back uh, mat, uh, pull back classes and say K theory or cohomology things like this. Um, so so this is really playing the role of the Schubert variety. These B orbit closures and symmetric these symmetric varieties are playing the role of the Schubert varieties in type A. All right. So I think I have approximately five minutes left. So that's just enough time for a very very small example. Um, and, and the reason why I want to bring up this very, very small example is because it lets me sort of explicitly touch on uh, formulas for, for quiver polynomials in this, in this case, which is work in progress. Okay, so uh, here I'll work with this D4 quiver. Uh, I'll fix dimension vector at Y0 and Y0 prime to be zero. Uh, so really I'm working with an A2 quiver, a really boring A2 quiver, um, where the dimension vector over Y1 and X1 are one. Okay, so I'm just, it's just a single vertex. It's either not zero or it's zero. So there are two orbits here. There's an open orbit and a closed orbit. Um, then in this case, I can take Q star to be Q um, and I can take um, the dimension vector D star to be D. So there's, we can sort of skip this Q star step because I'm already bipartite. In this case, the slice in G mod K, the sub variety of G mod K, looks like this collection of invertible matrices inside of G, okay? Um, and then the representation variety and the closed orbit zero inside of the representation variety embed into the slice using our map as either the idea, given by the vanishing set of the ideal A minus B, and that, that just comes from if you look at what the map looks like, um, and A comma B respectively, okay? Um, the corresponding clans, um, which you can easily uh, sort of work out if you know how to translate um, uh, ranks to get clans, just like you, you know how to say, say you know the Schubert variety story, you, if I give you a Schubert variety or some rank conditions, you would know how to write down the permutation. It's an, the analog here. Given some, some ranks, uh, you can get the clans. And I said clans are strings of, of, of numbers and pluses and minuses with certain conditions. Um, so I get these explicit corresponding clans. Um, and I'm interested in computing quiver polynomials. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I have a torus, uh, which is just C cross cross C cross, which acts on rep by conjugation here. Um, this induces a grading on the coordinate ring um, where the degree of my variable is, is T minus S, where I identify uh, um, my, my uh, grading group with um, free abelian groups on, on T and S respectively, okay? Um, and then uh, we can compute this T minus S, which I mean, we can, we can read it off immediately here that this is the, the, uh, the multi-degree say of um, the closed orbit. Um, but the point is, is that we can do this more generally. We can compute uh, this as a ratio of specialized, uh, what I'll call Weiser-Yang polynomials. Uh, so uh, Ben Weiser and Alex Yang uh, studied uh, these, uh, the obtained combinatorial, um, combinatorial polynomials that represent the equivariant homology of uh, classes in G mod K. Um, and so, Weiser Young polynomials. So we can compute um, this, this, um, this multi degree of the quiver locus as a ratio of specialized Weiser Young polynomials. The first Weiser Young polynomial corresponding to the first clan that I had on the previous slide is C1 minus D1 plus C2 minus D2. The second Weiser Young polynomial associated to the clan 1122 uh, is as written. Um, and then when I do an appropriate substitution of variables, um, I obtain the, the quiver polynomial that I was after. So, so actually uh, writing down the proof, and so I'm not claiming this is a theorem. Uh, it, I mean, it works in this example and many in other examples that we've tried, uh, but I expect that it's gonna work. In general, it's a matter of following maps and tracing, tracing substitutions um, to get combinatorial quiver polynomials in type D. Um, and so this is joint work in progress with Zach Hamaker and Ryan Kinzer. Um, and so I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thanks very much for the talk. So are there more questions? You can unmute yourself. 
Thanks. Uh, so I have a question. So I'm new to this whole um, super polynomial story. But so in your last example, what would it actually uh, tell you? Yeah. So, so this quiver polynomial here, this the one, the particular one that I'm writing down, this is giving me the uh, essentially a representative for the equivariant cohomology class of the closed orbit in this case, which is just zero inside of the representation space, um, or the language that I was using is this multi-degree um, that can be uh, recovered from the the Hilbert, the multigraded Hilbert series, um, and so sort of there are different motivations for studying quiver polynomials. Uh, the one that I mentioned is uh, coming from understanding degeneracy loci of vector bundles. So the idea would be to relate uh, these quiver polynomials to uh, formulas for the classes of degeneracy loci of vector bundles corresponding, say, to vector bundles in the configuration of a type D quiver. Yeah. But my, my understanding, even though I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, uh, is that there are also connections to uh, structure constants uh, for cohomological Hall algebras of Dinkin quivers as well. Uh, there's a, w work, a paper of Rimani uh, on this, but this is, this is not my area, so I, I don't want to say more really than that. But if, uh, that, if that is something that interests you, then uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe look at his, his, his papers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so, so maybe like from knowing it explicitly in these examples and being able to compute it, we're actually able to compare things uh, really in examples. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. So I have a question about the connection between type A and type D. Mm -hmm. So I, I often like to see the type D as some kind of folding, which is, okay. which is more type B usually, but really for quivers, I, I think it's type D. By okay. saying you take type A uh, double size uh, Dinkin uh, diagram, and then you take the graph automorphism. Okay. And then in the middle, you want to have a fixed point for this graph automorphism. Mm -hmm. And then it, uh, you can, it induces an endomorphism of the web station space at this point and splits it into, say, plus and minus eigenspaces. Okay. Uh, and then when you, when you take some of the orbit space, this gives you the type D quiver by, by, uh, by this folding. And in the middle, you have these two eigenspaces. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you can use results of type A and do some procedure like this, and then uh, get formulas which you see now in type D. Hmm. That's a very interesting idea. I, I have never uh, thought about it from that perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I've heard people say something similar to this before, but I, I guess I don't, I don't know at, at, at the moment if, if that could be uh, helpful for the particular types of problems that we're studying. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It's interesting. It's an interesting thought. I mean, many people connect folding with type B, which is very yeah. different than this folding, but, but I think there is a type D folding as well in, in this yeah. sense. Do you know of a reference for, for this? Yes, yes, uh, but uh, it's a very old one from the 60s. Okay. I, I, can, I can try to find it and send it to you. <laughs> sure, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. So more questions? Is it possible to say something about why this bipartite condition is so useful? Yeah, so the, I, guess the, I guess the idea is that um, because you can do this collapsing from bipartite orientation to any orientation, it really, uh, if you're interested in geometric questions, uh, it kind of completely governs the geometry of, of every single orientation. So basically you're inserting arrows and vertices to go from an arbitrary orientation to the bipartite orientation in a very natural way so that you have this, this homogeneous fiber bundle construction. Ah, uh, okay, yes, sorry, thank you. Yeah. And then this also works in type A. It's, it's yeah, it works, it works. Uh, thing that yeah, you that's right. Yeah, that's, that was the first place that we used it. It was in type A. And then in type D, you can't quite, you can't quite go from every orientation to bipartite type D. You have to sort of have the flexibility, add, add your flexibility of working with this extra, extra arrow, or you have to work with two quivers, one that's bipartite or, and one that's sort of almost bipartite where the, the, at the uh, air, you know, one arrow is coming in and one's coming out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and great. You can, thank you. You can choose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question stemming from my ignorance of this other side of the story. Um, in, in five varieties, you've got Bot Samuelson varieties. Mm -hmm. They're nice yep. combinatorial resolutions of singularities. Do, do you have similar things for these cousin Lustig varieties? Oh, uh, I 
I would wonder if you could just use the bot Samuelson resolutions uh, and and sort of use the map sort of the correspondence to get a, a similar resolution. But I I've never thought about the details there, so I don't know. But that would be maybe what I would try. I also wanted to ask, you mentioned the weak order briefly in passing, but mm -hmm. um, is there like a, a weak order on clans and a weak order yes. on, okay. And, and, yeah, uh, exactly. And so actually that's how these wiser young polynomials are defined. They're, they're defined recursively, just as Schubert polynomials are defined recursively. They start with uh, these beta double Schubert polynomials um, uh, and, and give a definition for polynomials that represent uh, the multi degrees uh, well, and other things um, for what are called matchless clans, so clans that just have pluses and minuses in them, and they represent they they parameterize the closed orbits uh, in G mod K, um, and then they give a divided difference type recursion that that gives the other the other ones. Fun. Yeah. So is this poset appearing somewhere else? This clans poset. This clans poset. Uh, yeah. The only place, I mean, I guess the only places I know where it occurs, where they appear, is uh, in in these settings, right? This, the, I think, I think, if I'm under, if if I, if I, and I could be wrong about this, but my my understanding is that they were really, it was developed now, uh, to study these this this ordering oh, in G mod okay. K. Okay. Yeah, the orbit closures in G mod K, and so maybe maybe elsewhere, but uh, now type D quivers, I guess, as well. So I had a quick question. Uh, first, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, second, when you talked about the type A quivers and yes. the story behind them, you pointed out some specific features that the equi-oriented type A like, admits. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any analogous result about any specific orientation of type D? Of type D or type A? Type D. Because for type A, you pointed out, for example, that uh, the cleaver loci are in uh, scheme theoretic uh, isomorphism with mm -hmm. open subvarieties as of the Schubert cells. Do you have any similar result for the uh, uh, symmetric varieties for the yeah. orientation of type D? So maybe I'll say is that actually, uh, so in a paper of Ryan Kinzer and myself, we actually generalized this equi-oriented thing to all orientations. So it, it, this, this result is true in all orientations in type A. Um, I just mentioned the equi-oriented case because that's sort of the more classical uh, story. Uh -huh. um, but it, it's, it's true in all orientations that there's this sort of affine space uh, up to this, so this sort of this nice smooth factor. Uh, every orbit closure in a type A quiver uh, is, is, regardless of orientation, is isomorphic to up to this, this smooth factor. Uh, to an open subvariety of a Schubert variety, and you can explicitly write down the Schubert variety, the permutation, and so on. Uh -huh. um, and that's sort of what allows for, well, one thing that allowed allowed us to get a nice formulas, quiver polynomial formulas in in all orientations. Uh, in type D, uh, I guess what I'm trying to uh, one thing I'm trying to illustrate here um, is that the what should play the role of the Schubert variety here are these or B orbit closures in G mod K. Or equivalently, be orbit closures in, in double Grossmannians, if you'd like, instead. I see. Okay. But, um, but yeah, the Gmod K story seems to be uh, quite nice. So, so that's what we we're choosing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Well, I have a comment. Uh, first, uh, thanks for the, for the talk. And then um, maybe this would partially answer Ben's question. But uh, I don't know about uh, about samples and resolutions for uh, the cousin lucid varieties. But if you take a B orbit closure in in double Grassmannian, yes, there there is a bot samples and resolution. And uh, well, there was a paper of mine and then a paper of uh, Peran and Ahinger where it was generalized. I don't know if it helps. Thanks. Um, Um, can I just ask one more thing about the clans thing? Yeah. So in, in type A, like there, if I understood what you said, or maybe I didn't understand, I have no idea. The, the thing that corresponds to the normal Bruhat order um, on sh on the Schubert variety is just something that's basically the Bruhat order again yeah. in type A, but in type D, it's something else. It's just clans. That's right, yeah. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah uh, there's a, if, you're, if you want a, common, a completely combinatorial description, 
of this. There's a paper of, of Ben Weiser on this. Got it. Yeah. Is there anything resembling higher brew hot orders for clans? I don't know. This yeah. is, you know, my, my favorite yeah. pet topic that no one else likes, but uh, the yeah, I don't know. Orders are, are, but they actually seem to play some role in flag varieties um, in type A, and they don't exist in some other, in like type D in, in actual flag varieties. But I see. But maybe they exist in cover variety land where. Uh, I yeah, that, I mean, that's possible. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. I saw a few blue hands, but I think they are all gone now. I think that's solved. Is there anybody left who wanted to ask a question? Who I missed? I think that's it. Then let's thank the speaker again. Lovely talk.